Okay. Are we blessed? I think so. <laughs> hey, it's a blessing to, um, to, to be alive in this time, I really think. Um, where there is increased knowledge, and with increased knowledge, there is increased responsibility because too much is given, much is required, right? And so um, we give thanks to the Father that there is a uh, greater level of understanding today, and uh, one of the evidences of that, knowledge is going to be increased, we know. Daniel talks about that. Uh, also, knowledge of wickedness is increasing, sadly. Um, but we know greater is he who's in us than he who's in the world. And uh, Brother Miles Jones here um, just got back from Saudi Arabia and, uh, and went to the uh, foot of what is off. More and more people are starting to believe this is Mount Sinai, like the Mount Sinai. Um, and Hat has a remarkable story to tell. Uh, he's also going to talk about the Hebrew Gospels. Um, often forgotten, set aside, all oh, that's Jewish stuff, you know, and sometimes even suppressed. And so I'm really curious uh, to hear what he has to say this night, and I'm glad you're all here. And, um, and also I want to mention that um, he came here. He has never at, he, he's not asked for a speaking fee. Uh, he's not said anything about expenses or anything, and that tells me he's here for the right reasons. He just wants to get the word out and, and get that going. And so I encourage you, we have a donation box here when you when you leave. Uh, you know, he, it does cost money to do this. So if you could help contribute toward his efforts, I'm sure that'd be greatly appreciated. Um, but we're here, we're here to draw closer to our Heavenly Father. Our, the knowledge that we are given is here for us to be able to more effectively know how to love, right? The purpose of the law, purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart. A sincere faith, uh, and we don't want to stray from that and not understanding what we're saying or affirming. And so uh, we're excited to hear uh, his testimony and, and the knowledge that he has been given. And, uh, and let's just allow our Heavenly Father to speak to us through his spirit. And so without further ado, Brother Miles, open us up with a word of prayer and say a few words. i got a video to share after that. It is really exciting to be here and to get a chance to meet so many of you. We're going to start off with a word of prayer here, if you would. <clears throat> Yehovah, God Almighty, such a privilege and a pleasure to be here to pass on this really fascinating knowledge about the truth of Scripture and the truth of your holy mountain. But I know that if your spirit and your love are not in this in this arena, then my words are, are pretty empty. It's like the doctor who can tell you all about your disease but can't cure you. May your spirit fall on this audience and enter into their hearts and, and judge the truth of the words that I have to offer. Your presence is what will make all the difference in this room. Otherwise, it's just another doctor pontificating up on the platform. So in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, let your spirit be with us. Amen. Thanks, folks. We're going to start off with some videos from Mount Sinai. We're here at the base of the mountain in the Jabal Laws Range with two major...
Ranger Peaks right beside it. But here we have everything that is stated in scripture is at the altar that Moses and the Israelites built. The columns that were dedicated to the 12 tribes of Israel and the holding pins where they took the animals to be slaughtered. All this we find at the base of this mountain in Midian where scripture says Mount Sinai is located. This is the third day of our expedition at Mount Sinai. Yesterday, my beloved Catherine and I decided to marry at Moses' altar. We spent half the night getting ready. Be ready the third day. Yehovah will come down upon Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. Yehovah called Moses and all the elders up to the mountain, right up there, and speaks to Moses and relays his covenant and his rulings Moses then comes down and repeats them to all the people. All the people answered with one voice, we will obey every word. We will obey every, every word. word. Catherine, Miles spoke words of his, his love and his covenant promise to you. Will you accept those? I do. Miles and Catherine have spoken her words and covenant promises to you. Do you accept them? I do. So, from this point forward, you're known as Mr. and Mrs. Jones. And it came to pass on the third day, there were thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mountain and the voice of the shofar exceedingly loud. So what did you think of the video? Does that sound like what happened in Exodus 19 
on the third day. Well, they didn't mean the third day of our expedition. They meant Tuesday, right? First day is, first day is Sunday, second day is Monday, third day is Tuesday. So it was Tuesday. So this ceremony, the Ketupa ceremony, has not been done at Mount Sinai at the altar for 3,500 years. So everyone in our group, because they're, they're all from our institute, B'nai Umina Institute, we translate the Hebrew Gospels, uh, we all did a ketubah ceremony, which is a marriage ceremony, where we promised to obey all the commandments of Yehovah, just like they did in the first time that was there. Okay, so the depiction you saw there was not a depiction. All these things happened six weeks ago at Mount Sinai right after that ceremony. Now, I want you to know I've lived in Saudi Arabia two times, and I've never seen it rain. Ever. It doesn't rain in Saudi Arabia. You know, they say maybe once or twice a year, but what you're seeing is uh, maybe a sprinkle of rain. I mean, it's the driest place in the world. Did it look like the driest place in the world? That flood happened March 14th, 2023. The same day that we did the Ketubah ceremony at the base of Mount Sinai. Immediately finishing the, immediately as we finished the ceremony, we went down, back down, and, and, and ate, and a, a great wind arose and started blowing clouds into the, into the, uh, over the mountain until they covered the mountain. And there was thundering and there was lightning, right? A lot of thundering and lightning. And then it started to rain. And it, we ran for the Land Rovers, right, to get in out of the rain. And it started coming down. It was a torrential rain. It was not just a rain. And then it started to hail. And then even later, it started to snow. Remember, this is Saudi Arabia going into summer. Now, I don't know about you. I'm from Texas. But our summer starts March 31st. You're right. I mean, it's hot. It can be over 100 degrees. In Saudi Arabia, it can be over 100, 110, 120, even 130. And all of a sudden, you're experiencing a Swedish winter in a Saudi summer. Is that dramatic enough? So all of, all of that came from our trip. We had a camera crew with us. So we took pictures of the clouds coming in. They covered the mountain. It started to thunder and lightning. And then the rain came down. Then the hail came down. And the, but this is more than just us. We, this wasn't all because of us. We're, I'm, just a, I'm just a player in this thing. God, an act of God was come, going on in the region. Now, I, we're, we're just a part of it. So I, I can't explain what's going on, but something is clearly going on. Because after that ceremony, they've been having flooding down in the south. In fact, they had a geyser come out of the ground in the Rubal Kali, in the desert, the Rubal Kali. Came out of the ground, water, created a river, created a lake. The Saudis are out there jet skiing on the lake. Right? This is like three weeks before. Okay, now you've got massive flooding, you've got snowing. And right after, right after we left, I mean it was flooding already in the streets of Arabia. You know, in the, in the part we were in and the part down south. Then it started to snow. So you had three or four feet of snow in Saudi Arabian cities. Some of these people have never seen snow. All right, so that's going on. And there was flooding. And this is just in the weeks following this event, uh, the Ketubah ceremony. There was snowing. There was floods in Oman. There were floods down in the south and in Yemen. Down the south of Arabia, there are floods in the Negev Desert. You know, people died in these floods. You know, they, had, they had to get people out of stranded cars that were, were stranded in the, in the flood. So it, it was a huge deal, especially for this region of the world. So I'm hoping somebody can explain this to me at the end of this presentation. <laughs> What's going on over there? But I can tell you one thing, this is not normal weather in Saudi Arabia, right? And it happened immediately, started happening in the north in the area where we were 
at Mount Sinai. It's called Jebel Al-Laws. But it uh, started happening right after we did the ceremony where all of us took a pledge to Yehovah that we would obey all the commandments, everything that he had said. You know, in the Ketubah ceremony in Exodus 19. First time that's happened in 3,500 years. And the way it felt to me at the time was that he took every arrow he had out of his quiver to make sure we know he had heard us. This is the first time a new covenant group, a messianic group had come to the base of Mount Sinai and made that, and made that covenant with him. And it won't happen again. Because from now on, they will send minders with the, the people. Not because of what happened with us. They were always planning to do this. They don't want any overt religious ceremony on the mountain. But we came, we crossed the desert to Sinai. We were, it was an expedition. We crossed the desert in our Land Rovers. And, uh, but they were building so fast on the city of Neom that, um, in that area that... Um, by the time we left 10 days later, we drove out on paved streets, paved roads. So it'll be very easy for people to go now. I'm sure they'll have hotels. And by this time next year, there'll be hotels down on the main road. So that, there's good and bad about this. So, you know, more people will get to see Mount Sinai. Yay, right? That's good. Worried about the inscriptions that are there that we went to document the inscriptions that were at Mount Sinai and the footprints of the Israelites and uh, hoping nobody goes in there and scoops them all up. And Dead Sea Scrolls, when they came out, you could buy one for $3,000, right? Now a fragment of a page will run for about a quarter million. These are 2,000 years older than that, and they are biblical in nature, right? So that was the exciting story of Sinai. And we're, we're gonna do, uh, we're going to change gear here and talk about the Hebrew Gospels, all right? And I will, we will end the presentation, and then if you have to go, take your kids home, feed your animals, whatever, uh, you can go, or you can stick around, and we'll do question and answer. Does that work for you? Okay, so I'll give you as much as you can take away. So we're going to talk about the Hebrew Gospels. We are very well known not, not only for the biblical archaeology work we've done, the historical linguistics. We did, you know, some 10 years ago, I wrote the book on the writing of God, the inscriptions of the base of Mount Sinai that are biblical. They come straight from the pages of Exodus. And then Jehovah had not finished with me. He told me to go to Israel and get the first the earliest copy of the Gospels in Hebrew. Well, you know, I'd been studying this for a year, and I knew all the experts said, Eh, there weren't any Hebrew Gospels. And even if there were, they're gone now. They're no, no, nothing survived. So it's the nothing survived argument if they ever existed. So uh, every expert, there was not a single one who said the Hebrew Gospels survived or admitted they were even written. But I went, I went to uh, Israel and I found them. The Polanski Project has a database of all Hebrew Gospels. There's what they call a thousand years of silence springing from the first century. The uh, Greek church that was being formed was their competition. And the, the, the Judaic church wasn't too happy with the Messianics either. So uh, they burned every Hebrew manuscript. They didn't know what they said. They just burned them. Right? The Hebrew Gospels are by far the most forbidden book in the history of humankind. Right? You want books on magic? Go to the Vatican, there's shelf after shelves of them. There's probably a whole building just full of that stuff. Right? You want satanic literature? It's there too. Every library. I have tons of this stuff. You want the Hebrew Gospels? Pretty much have to come to B'nai Imana Institute that we run to to translate the Hebrew Gospels. But I'm going to share that with you tonight, what we're, what we're doing with them. So the most important question to ask about the Hebrew Gospels is, are they authentic, right? They're always, every Hebrew manuscript is always called a translation, all right? Translation from the Greek or the Latin, right? So therefore, it's not important at all. 
Excuse me? All right, there was another clicker here. <clears throat> Okay, Dr. Jones is without a clicker. This is, a, this is an emergency. This one is not working. Do you have the other one? Tom, you have the other clicker? All right, so the Hebrew Gospels exist. They survived. I went to Israel, I found the first manuscript, the Hebrew Gospels from Catalonia, which is in Spain. And then I found a second one later on. Well, I knew of it. It's called the Shem Tov manuscript. How many people have heard of that? Okay, good. It was, and they, and we, an examine of, examination of them show they come from a single original source. Because there's just far too many things about it that are the same. We good now? So uh, they come from a single source. I found another one in Europe called the Romant Bible. It's not in Hebrew, but it showed that they had translated the Hebrew Gospels into some of the early Euro European languages. All right, it had all the markers. Is it good now? Okay, all right. So I had three of them three manuscripts sitting on my study in Texas. This is it. It works. Up and down. Up and down. This one? And down. Right. Up and then down. Okay, good. All right, so I had three manuscripts. I figured that there's gotta be more. So I went to Europe. My, my, my wonderful list of people, please sign up on our interest list. We will try and keep you apprised. We send research update newsletters out to let you know what's going on. And it's free, it doesn't cost anything. We try to keep you up to date on what's going on. You might also want to subscribe to our, our uh, YouTube channel. It's called Writing of God, surprise, surprise. Uh, we're gonna be starting a television show. It's gonna come up either the end of this month or Early, early in June, sometime in June. And if you subscribe to our newsletter channel, they'll send you a notice whenever something comes online so you can, you can watch it. And that'll, that's free too, so you wanna sign up for that. But I wanna get back to the topic. You know, we talked about the, when we talk about the Gospels, this is the, this is the question that always comes up, especially if you're talking to someone from the, the new churches, the mainstream churches. Uh, our church existed long before theirs did, so they're always asking, well, what does it matter? What does it matter if the Gospels were written in Greek or Hebrew? And my answer to that is it doesn't matter at all, unless, of course, you care about the truth of the Bible. Then it matters enormously. It matters enormously because the, the Hebrew was first, and so it records the original words of our Savior, Yeshua and what he said and the Greek came later and this is what they call Hebrew primacy Greek primacy Latin primacy each of the churches in, is in competition to you know be the original church with the original Bible right so the the Greek church will tell you well the Greek manuscripts are the most authentic right and the the Roman church, the Latin church, will tell you the same thing. The Latin, the Latin Bibles are the most authentic. Well, the most authentic Bibles are the Hebrew Bibles, right? Because that's what was written first. The first compilation of the Bible was written in 150 A.D. 150 A.D. and it's written by Messianics. That's almost certain because they used the Tanakh and the Hebrew Gospels as their, as their source materials. Right? The Greek was out there by that time. The Greek books of the New Testament were out there. All right? and the, but the, they recorded it from the Hebrew. It's called the Itala Bible. Then about 150 years later, in 290, Lucian of Antioch, who also was a Messianic, wrote a compilation in Greek. 
using the Itala and the Hebrew Gospels and the, and the Greek, the, the Hebrew Gospels uh, that were still out there, they were still extant. Um, so you have this great, these two great compilations of the Bible, which you probably have never heard of because the spin that's put on it is that the, the Catholic Bibles that came out in the next century were the earliest Bibles, the original Bibles, the original compilation of the Bibles. Not so. You have two basically competing streams of manuscripts going down through the century to this very day. And we have them. Okay, once, once I started talking about it on the news, I think libraries, partially because of our work, libraries started realizing, well, maybe these manuscripts we have are not all translations from Greek or Latin. Maybe they're really important. So they, as I predicted, they started blossoming like flowers in the spring. We now have 85 manuscripts of the Hebrew Gospels. Six of them are complete compilations. We have authenticated some as coming from a first century source. And the first thing we're going to do is answer that question. Is it just a translation or does it have the markers of the Hebrew Gospels? Having translated the original manuscript and compared it to what comes down to us, I know what the markers of the Hebrew Gospel are, and I'm going to share those with you in the manuscripts themselves. I'm going to tell you a story about Sukkot, 30 AD, okay, from the Hebrew Gospels. Does that sound like a good plan? Okay, so you have this competing manuscript tradition from the Hebrew translated into the early European languages. Isn't this amazing? All of this is stuff that, you know, they don't want to see the power of Greek primacy of the Bible is taught in every seminary. Every seminary pounds it into you. It's an article of faith that the Bible was originally written in Greek. I don't know about you, but I don't care. If it was originally written in Hebrew, I want the truth. I want the earliest, most original manuscript. And if that manuscript is in Greek, well, it's in Greek. I want that original, earliest manuscript to study. You with me on this? I want the truth. I want the truth. And what turns out is about half of the New Testament was written in Greek and about half was written in Hebrew originally. But of the, the ones that were written in Greek were very early on translated into Hebrew. So the first compilation was of the Hebrew Gospels and, and the Brit Hadashah later as all the letters came up. For, because the church, it was a messianic affair. For the first few centuries, it was a messianic affair entirely. Those were the believers, and they couldn't read Greek. So it was written up in Hebrew, and the Greek letters were translated into Hebrew. All right, you, you follow me so far? All this is a hidden, a hidden story that you're not supposed to know about. So it's too late, though, because you came. So now you're going to know, as, he, as Tom said, thank you, Tom. Uh, we got, had a wonderful talk today about the really miraculous things that are going on in this congregation. So uh, that's one reason it's such a pleasure to be here, to see it happening. All right, here's why it's so important. Everything we know about our Hebrew Messiah comes to us through the Greek filter of another language, culture, and thought. All right? When you go back to the Hebrew, a whole new perspective is unveiled. Okay? That's not the only thing. There are some things that have been changed in the Greek scriptures. It's not that hard to understand. This is not heresy to say. But if something appears in the 4th century manuscripts, wasn't there before, it was added in the 4th century. Okay, and so, I mean, it's just, it's just a matter of historical fact. But, you know, you're not going to get anybody to, that's going to sort of step outside of the box of Greek primacy. The Hebrew Gospel of Matthew was the original gospel. How do we know that? All the early church fathers said it was. That's how we know. <clears throat> I'm going to catch up on the screen, I guess. 
Okay, there's like dozens and dozens of attestations, historical attestations saying that the, the, the first gospel, Matthew, is originally written in Hebrew, right? But also Luke, because none of the apostles put their name on it. They did not want to take away from the glory of Yeshua, their Savior. They did not want to do that. So they didn't put in we, the names. So you want to know if things have been added to the Gospels? Yeah, the names have been added. Right? Sometimes they, you know, so, and we know we have plenty of attestation of Matthew and, and Luke. Luke was originally written in Hebrew also. All right? we, and we'll tell you, remember they have quotations from the Hebrew Gospels? About 80 quotations in the, in the literature. And uh, some of them come from Luke, not from Matthew. That's how we know that Luke also was originally written in Hebrew. Because these are the early church fathers. The first century, second century, and, and, and on up. So, I don't want to blind myself. All right, so no, no early Christian writer denied that Hebrew, Matthew was written in Hebrew. Nobody did, even those that didn't like it. So modern scholars really don't like this. They're totally different, you know, fast forward 2,000 years, modern scholarship, which we know, does anyone have any doubt that that the universities have been secularized and are anti-religious? Nobody? Okay, good, that's good. Well, so have the seminaries. Yeah, yeah, well, in my way of thinking, all right. All right, there. They don't, many of the seminaries do not believe that the Exodus actually happened, for example. They certainly don't believe that the Gospels are originally written in Hebrew. So that's kind of a secularization process going on. Well, where did they get their archaeological knowledge? From the universities, right? So that's what they tend to teach in seminary. You, you with me on this? So the working hypothesis of modern scholarship is that an erroneous judgment about the existence of an original Hebrew gospel was mentioned as early as Papias and that veneration from ancient testimony caused the error to be transmitted and elaborated rather than rectified and uprooted. Sounds good. But that's not what happened. Right? Jerome translated it in the fourth century. He mentioned it many, many times, four times, in fact, that he had translated the Hebrew Gospels into Latin and Greek. And, and the other church fathers did too. You'll see the proofs in here. When they surrounded the Messianic community, and it's written in, in Luke, right? It, when the, the armies, the Roman armies of Vespasian and his uh, son, Titus. Titus, by the way, was Vespasian's son and he was destined to become Caesar himself. But he commanded the armies that surrounded Jerusalem. In Daniel, he's called the prince. So in case you, in case you read Daniel, when it prophesies about the prince surrounding Jerusalem, that's Titus. Okay, when he surrounded them, then it says that I will send an angel to you to warn you and flee. flee. So did the, why did the Romans let them out? Because that's less people demand the walls when they attack. Right? So they let people go. They let people run out. Right? So they, they left and they fled to Jordan, to Pella. And then later many of them went on to Spain, which had, it's called Sephirot in the Bible, which had the largest population of Jews and Messianics outside of Israel. And some came back to, to Israel, uh, Jerusalem in particular, after things had quieted down. Some stayed in Pella, all right? This is the Messianic church we're talking about. Our forebears, yes, you with me? So this is the story you're seeing here from the Hebrew Gospels. So this, all the, all the, uh, the text you're seeing over here is from the Hebrew Gospels, in particular the Hebrew Gospels from Catalonia. Like I said, there's 85. This is what has really slowed us down because people always they want to know they want it out now, and, and I do too, but you've got 85 manuscripts, you've got to kind of sort through them, and we will have them all translated and archived for people to read, but basically we have to be it gives us a lot of material, enough to be able to get back to the original text 
of the word because some places it'll be obscured or changed or not written. Other places it will be, but we, we, we have enough knowledge to know how to put it back together into a single piece with all the oldest parts intact. So we can do that, but it's quite a job. So please consider supporting us. In 1971, excavators of the Church of the Holy Sculpture, Sepulchre, broke through a wall and discovered a room dated to the early second century when the Messianic Church was still predominant, but is being forced to immigrate. They discovered a red and black drawing of a sailing vessel with the inscription, Domine Ivimus, Latin for Lord, we went. Where did they go? They went across the sea to Sepharad, the new Jerusalem, where the largest community of Jews and Messianics lived, a refuge for immigrants from a century and a half of Roman war against Israel. By the way, their method, there were many revolts by the Hebrews against, by the Israelites against Rome. And the Roman policy was to go into the country and crucify people at random by the hundreds, by the thousands, until the revolution stopped. They killed a million and a half people over a century and a half, according to the records that we have. They killed as many Israelites proportional to the world population as were killed in the Holocaust. Approximately one out of three. But somehow they gave themselves a pass when it came to the Gospels. In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, right? <clears throat> All Jews were forced to leave in 1492. They finally kicked the rest of the Muslims out of Spain. They had invaded in, in the eighth century and hung on for, for that many years, for like seven or eight centuries. So they finally kicked the last of them out at Granada and then they expelled all the Jews. And the last day of the expulsion when they had to leave, Columbus ships left, full of fleeing Jews and Messianics, Israelites, Hebrews, and Messianics. The Messianics were fleeing the Inquisition. They were believers, but the church, they were not, they had created a church of their own, many of them. Uh, there were about half a million Hebrews living in Spain in the Middle Ages, and uh, more than half of them converted to Christianity. Okay, some wanted to just blend in, some didn't care, some were faking it, uh, but many of them had the Hebrew Gospels. He said, this is, a, you know, this is a Hebrew story. It's a Hebrew God. It's a Hebrew Savior, right? We're going to have it in the Hebrew tongue, in the Lashon HaKodesh, all right? So we're going to teach our children from the Bible. We're going to continue to honor the feast days and the Sabbath day, right? And we're going to have yeshivas in our schools to teach them, right? Did you know the Messianics initiated the bar mitzvah? Based on the chapter in Luke, or the passages in Luke where Yeshua was stranded at the, at the temple and they came back three days later and he's sitting there and all, all of the rabbis are amazed at his knowledge of the word and his understanding of it. That was the first bar mitzvah, or bat mitzvah for, for ladies. Uh, but it is the time when, when a young man or woman becomes an accepted adult in the congregation. You know, they become a covenant keeper, a commandment keeper. That was a messianic thing. And then the Jews copied it, of course. Right, so that happened back in 1492, they had this. Okay, so Columbus went to the New World and you've probably heard the story that, that, uh, that uh, Queen Isabella, she pawned her royal crown jewels to pay for the voyage. Has anyone heard that story? You, one, one, come on, raise your hand. Don't be ashamed. Okay, so some of you have heard it. Well, that's, that's spent, that did not happen. What happened is that Columbus was a messianic, right? We know this. I'm not going to go into the whole proof, but it, I have written it in my books. You know, he spoke Hebrew. 
He did not come from Italy. He didn't speak Italian. He did not come from Italy. His sons recited a Kaddish prayer at his deathbed. He burned his family's records, his family records, so they wouldn't find out of his Hebrew background because they were burning people at the stake. This at the height of the Inquisition. The Inquisition lasts for 350 years, but the, the worst parts of it were at the beginning, you know, where they would burn thousands, you know, tens of thousands every year. So they're trying to destroy them. Right? This was not the Roman Church going on here, was it? They, so many people had had converted that they left synagogues empty. So they gave them the synagogues to use as their church. They didn't really want them in their church, right? So they gave them the synagogues to use. So many rabbis converted that they made the, they made them priests. They had messianic bishops, messianic priests, messianic congregations meeting in synagogues. This is not the Roman church, is it? Right? And they were worshiping the Sabbath day. They were worshiping the festivals. They, were, they had the holy book in Hebrew. They had the, the Hebrew gospels were extant. They were still, they were out there at that time. We know that. In fact, that's what we, you'll be seeing on these pages. The Hebrew gospels from Catalonia in Spain. So, the Spanish Inquisition was initiated to burn the Messianics, to crush the resurgent Messianic church. There you have it. So during 1492 and the two years following, they had the blood moons appear two years in a row on Passover and Sukkot, two years in a row. That's happened three times this century, right? Every time it's been during a time when the great, great peril for the Hebrews, right? And this point, it was the expulsion from, from uh, Spain. As many of them, many of them were killed or robbed or, or destroyed or, or, or had their lives destroyed. And the, the Inquisition was a part of that. There would be no other tetrad of blood moons like that until this century, almost five centuries later. Well, more than five centuries later. Okay. So it's pretty significant. But during this time of trouble, they had the Hebrew Gospels that they used, you know, to... to get them through this crisis, these messianics that were fleeing. So Jews were fleeing the expulsion, messianics were fleeing the inquisition. The Hebrew gospels were used by them during those dark days. They later ended up in the Vatican Library, but they were bound beneath another Hebrew manuscript called the Tales of Sindabar. That is Sinbad the Sailor Man in Hebrew, right? So if you didn't read past that, and, and the Roman church, they were not encouraging you, you to read Hebrew. I mean, there are very few people that did. So unless you read past the first 100 pages, you would not realize there were Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John following them, right? So they were basically hidden in the belly of the beast for, for 500 years or almost. So by the hand of, this was really a well-known method of hiding a manuscript that you were afraid was going to be destroyed. And so from the Vatican, they were not discovered until 1939, they published a catalog that had the name of it, but it didn't have, not as the Gospels, as the Tales of Sindabar. It was not until 1956 that they discovered the manuscripts underneath there, the hidden manuscript that was hidden because it was in danger of being destroyed. The Hebrew Gospels existed that long without being discovered. What happened in, before 1956? Well, the Holocaust happened. World War II happened. That changed a lot of attitudes towards all the anti-Semitism that had been conducted against the Hebrews, right? So there was some real, real attitude changes went on. And one of them was to realize that these these Hebrew manuscripts that they held were a precious treasure, not something they should hide away. So this is significant stuff. With the less, with upon the condition that you need to remember that when they did the, the early Greek Church of Constantine in the fourth century had declared 
Now this is historical fact, but nobody's gonna, nobody's gonna talk this from the pulpit. They declared the Messianic Church, they divorced themselves from Judaism. They're creating a new religion, divorced from Judaism. You know, if you wear your hat in church, we're gonna take ours off. If you have church on, on Saturday, we're gonna have church on Sunday. You know, they were di distinguishing it from the other one. Uh, this new church, and it was an anti-Semitic church, that's what it was. They declared the church of Yeshua HaMashiach to be heretic. The Messianic church of the time is still very, very strong at this time, fourth century. It, for like seven centuries from the time of Yeshua, the, the Hebrew church was the core, the core pillar of the expanding church. Uh, mostly out of Antioch, since they pretty much leveled Israel. So, although this is historical fact, I, I suspect you've never heard of it. Am I right? Because nobody's going to tell you that from the pulpit. Oh yeah, by the way, we declared the church of Jesus, of Jesus Christ to be heretic. And then we proceeded to burn them and their, and their, and their scriptures. Nobody's going to tell you that from the pulpit. But this is an apostasy. And it, and it explains why there were so many pogroms and inquisitions and crusades and even the Holocaust were a part of this. Because sin not repented is going to repeat and repeat and repeat. Yeah? And there is no corporate exception for sin. Just because you're a church and you didn't do those things that happened back there doesn't mean that you're not carrying any burden of sin. If you're still carrying on some of those attitudes and trying to cover up the actions that happened. See what I'm saying? So there's still, and if you split from the, the old Roman church or the Greek church or whatever, that doesn't absolve you unless you split for that reason. Said no, we're, we're leaving this church. You declared Jesus Christ to be heretic. You declared Yeshua HaMashiach to be heretic. So this apostasy has gone on for a long time. So on that condition, they need to repent of it. And they're kind of stumbling their way to it. Uh, Pope Francis went and, and he did repent to the Waldensians in northern Italy. The other, I mentioned there's two, two streams of manuscripts. The Waldensians were Messianic in northern Italy. They actually left Rome because of persecution. They're never a part of the Roman church. And they moved up to the north. And they established the Italic Sea. Remember the Italic was their Bible? You know, the oldest compilation of the Bible from 150, right? And they were called the Italic Sea. A sea is a seat of church government. So for 2,000 years, there's been the Roman Sea in the south and the Waldensian Sea, the Italic Sea in the north. And you probably have never heard of that either. Am I right? They still exist. They're still very strong in the north of Italy, the Waldensians, and they are messianic. They're not getting any press. You know how that works. You know, you never acknowledge it in history books. You never, the history books are written by the predominant church. So the Hebrew Gospels in Spain so you got all you got all this going on, and it's just sort of the, the the official story is this: they were declared heretic in the fourth century, and they disappeared by the fifth century. All the believers, all the followers of Yeshua Hamashiach, when they were told they were heretic, they just went away like good little boys and girls. Does that sound right to you? No, they did not go away. You know, they did, they did have to flee often, but they continued to evangelize widely under fierce oppression throughout all those 2,000 years. And their history has never been told until now. We have it, we have it. In fact, there was so much documentation of it, I had to write it in two volumes, not one. So that's uh, Sons of Zion versus Sons of Greece, volume one and Messianic Church Arising, Volume 2. So it tells the story all the way to the present time. The survival of the Messianic Church throughout that time. 
So the, the thing that Tom talked to me about earlier was what is, we need, to, we need to realize why does this matter to us? I mean, I think it's fascinating knowledge. I hope you're enjoying it. Amen. All right. But how does that change us, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, I can tell you this, and I bet most of you have had a similar experience. When I came out of the mainstream church, I knew I was not supposed to be there anymore, but I didn't know where I was supposed to be. I know I was looking for Hebraic roots, right? But I didn't know of anybody who did this, you know? And uh, certainly not in my town at the time. But I had a friend in another town who said, yes, there is a roots meeting there, but it's sort of clandestine. But uh, in any case, there's this feeling of being an orphan. Isn't that about right? Yeah? I had a yes in the back. Anybody else feel kind of like an orphan when you first start out? You didn't know exactly what you're supposed to be doing. You know you're not supposed to be doing that, but you're not exactly sure what you are supposed to be doing. Okay? Now, we're here now in the epicenter of the Messianic movement. Thank you, Yehovah. Thank you. This is really, this is really fabulous. Uh, so, this history of the Messianic Church that this is really important to us. We are not orphans. We are the original church. In fact, Yeshua and his father, our church goes back to creation. Right? It goes back to creation. It was the original church and it survived all of that time and all of that oppression. Right? And it is still here today. Hallelujah. Let me hear it. Let me hear an amen. That is good, isn't it? We aren't. We aren't. We have had a long history of surviving through oppression and keeping the received text of the Bible alive. The reformers came to the Waldensians in Geneva and created the Reformation Bibles from the text that they had kept alive. And they wrote them, they translated them into the vernacular languages, the common languages of the peoples in Europe. Because before, they wanted a monopoly on the word, so it could only be written in Latin, right? And within 30 years, two-thirds of Europe became Protestant. Which was a good and noble thing. They stopped short, but it, what happened was a good and noble thing. Because it still kind of warmed over Roman church stuff. Anyway, never changed back to the Sabbath, never reinstituted the feast days. So, <clears throat> the Hebrew Gospels in medieval Spain existed. They were translated into the Catalan Gospels, the Shem Tov Hebrew manuscript that, you, that we talked about, and then they were translated back into the Hebrew Gospels from Catalan. At the time, if you're caught with the Hebrew Gospels, you'd be burned at the stake. If you had anything like that. And since they couldn't read Hebrew, any Hebrew manuscript you had, you'd probably be burned at this day. Your books would be taken and burned. Right? That's why the thousand years of silence existed, because of the oppression of the Messianic Church. Then they found the Dead Sea Scrolls in the second century, from the second century. That reduced it to only 800 years of silence, but it was extremely important, right? St. Jerome translated the Hebrew Gospel, testified in writing four times. Here's a quote, the Gospel according to the Hebrews that we have recently translated. Is he a credible ancient source? He's as good as they get. He was the one who actually did it. This is the preface to Matthew and the Hebrew Gospels from Catalonia. The first evangelist wrote this in the holy tongue from memory. That's the Lashon HaKodesh, by the way. Lashon HaKodesh. So this is one of the markers of the Hebrew Gospels. The preface will usually say that it was originally written in Hebrew. You won't see that in any Greek manuscript, for sure, will you? Somehow it got left out. They will use these same prefaces from St. Jerome often, but they'll eliminate that little discrepant detail. Here's a prologue to the Hebrew Gospel of Luke. How do we know that Luke was uh, originally written in Hebrew? Matthew was. Luke, as head, was also written in Hebrew. Now, remember when they, 
when they uh, translated it into Greek, which they did, they doubled it in size. Now, I'm not saying it's not the sacred word of God. It is, as to the best of my knowledge, is absolutely the sacred word of God. But they did add more of the story in, all right? And there are some things that are in there. So Epiphanius, who was the first church historian, for some odd reason, none of his work survives, right? But he was, a, he was a Jewish Christian. He wrote, they call it the Hebrew Gospels. And the beginning of their gospel starts like this. In the days when Herod was king of Judea. Does that come from Matthew? Nope. It comes from Mark. <clears throat> it comes from Luke, sorry. It comes from Luke. And Luke in the Hebrew Gospels is missing the first four verses. So guess what Luke starts with? It starts with, in the days when Herod was king of Judea. Just like Epiphanius said in the second century. So the Greeks added this, added in the first four verses. And this is a marker of the Hebrew Gospels. We find it in manuscripts all over the world. First four verses in Luke are missing. So it's a very important marker. So what do the first four verses say that makes them suspect? Well, read this. For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth a narrative, you know what that means, right? Picked up their pen, took it in hand, wrote it. Yes? Nod your head, yes? They wrote it out, right? They took it in hand. Of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them to us, from the, who, those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, that would be the apostles. They were the only ones that from the beginning had done this, and they're the ones that wrote it down. It seems good to me also, knowing all of these things from the first, to write unto you these things in order, most excellent Theophilus. So what is that saying? I'm paraphrasing here. Most excellent Theo, after receiving the original written narratives from the apostles, I'm writing this copy for you. Would you agree that's what it said? That's the meaning of it? Well, if you have one manuscript that says it's a copy, and one manuscript that does not say it's a copy, which one is most likely to be the original? The one that does not say it's a copy, right? That would be the Hebrew Gospels, right? So they're, they're trying to kind of boost this, oh, we got these manuscripts from the original apostles. Okay, that's fine, but you're Greeks. That's not the Hebrew, right? So it was added in. So it was about doubled in size. All right. The preface to Luke by Jerome, he was from, he dwelt in Antioch, a great doctor. Now, can remember that Mark and Luke were not, uh, they were followers of Yeshua, but they, they did not walk with him. They did not know him in their lifetime. Okay, you with me? I used to think, well, they're all apostles, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Mark and Luke never knew him, but they did know the apostles, so they, they got the information secondhand. It, too, is the sacred word of God, but it is secondhand. So the firsthand account trumps the secondhand account, right? If there are discrepancies, usually that's the case. And that would be Matthew. The only, the only gospel written by an apostle. Right now we'll talk about John. John is not attributed until late in the second century. It looks like they assigned John's name to it because they needed a Greek gospel written by an apostle to counteract the Hebrew gospel written by Matthew. Okay, if they didn't have an apostle that had written in a gospel in Greek, then the Hebrew gospel is the cornerstone of what we call today Christianity. They did not want this. All right? So they assigned the gospel of John without really any attribution of it. All the others were well attributed. We know Matthew wrote Matthew, Mark wrote Mark, Luke wrote Luke. We know that. Right? So it was the only one written by, you know, the, 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 the logical argumentation for all this, it's, it, it's in the book, and you should, you should read it, you should know it. We're not going to talk about who wrote John, but it's an important discussion. 
So we're going to look at what's in the, the, we're telling you the story of Sukkot. The menorah, these words, there are several words that have been eliminated from the Bible over the years. What are these things? Name of God. Right, this has been eliminated from the Bible. Early on, it was eliminated from the New Testament, right? Because they took the, the fact that the Jews had this oral tradition not to say the sacred name of God, which was forced on them by the Romans, by the way. You, you would be killed if you said the name of God. So they, the rabbi said, we've been meaning to tell you anyway that the name of God is too sacred for you to speak. Either that or all the rabbis would be, would be massacred. Right? So these words are eliminated from your Bible. These, here's a few examples. The name of God, the name of Yeshua, changed to Jesus, changed to the Greek name. Words like Torah, means the royal law, was changed to law, right? We're not talking about a speeding ticket here, right? It's a law is, is a relatively ambiguous word, but the word was Torah, right? That, that was removed from the Bible. Menorah, that word was removed from the Bible. It's called candlesticks, okay? But uh, menorah is a very specific thing. It was designed by, by Yehovah himself in Exodus 25, 31 through 40. And of course, this is the symbol of Judaism. So we can't make that a Christian symbol, right? We don't want to make that a Christian symbol. The new church did not want to make that a Christian. They divorced themselves from Judaism. So they're trying to clean all Judaism out of the new religion, including the Hebrew Gospels, of course, and the Messianics themselves. Okay, now, the, what does it do when these words disappear from the Bible? Did you know that Yeshua taught? Taught on the menorah? said, you do not light a candle and hide it under a bushel, but you put it on a menorah so it gives light to all in the house. So that means in the first century, the menorah was still being used in the household, not exclusively in the temple. And it's telling a story that was had very deep symbolism, didn't it? You put it on the menorah, which is a religious symbol. So your light is a spiritual light, right? That you want it to shine on everyone. You don't hide it under a bushel. Very meaningful, especially when you know the candlestick is not what they're talking about. They're talking about a menorah. So it's a very important thing. And the symbolism is pretty obvious, I think. <clears throat> Another reference to the Hebrew Gospel in Jerome's commentary on Matthew is the name of Barabbas, right? He said that in the Hebrew Gospels, it was the son of the teacher. Barabbas means the son of the father in Greek. It's Greek. But in Hebrew, it was Barabban, which is the son of the teacher, okay? So, in the gospel written according to Hebrews. Well, let's look in the Hebrew gospel. Here it is, mentioned four times. Bar-Rabban, 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 Bar-Rabban. So we hired a detective from the fourth century to look this up for us and give us this. <laughs> that's Jerome. That. So that's what you have to do. You have to go back and find a witness to what was in the Hebrew Gospel, then see if it's in the Hebrew Gospel. But that's one correlation. It's pretty good, right? right? Jerome said Barabbas was called Barabban in the Hebrew Gospel. We look in the Hebrew Gospel, he's called Barabban. Well, it wouldn't be that way if it was a translation from the Greek, would it? It wouldn't be that way at all. Yes? Are you with me? Okay, but that's one correlation. That can be a coincidence. Multiple correlations, then you have a pattern, right? Anyone can dismiss one correlation. So what do we need to establish the authenticity of the Hebrew Gospels, in particular from, Catalan, from Catalonia, which were the first ones that we looked at? But they gave us the markers that we've used on all the others. What would be perfect? How about this? A citation from a credible ancient source as to events are quotations in the Hebrew Gospels that are not in the Greek. Yeah, like St. Jerome in that last example. Okay, multiple citations of it would be better. Yes, 
more than just one person saying it. If we had several people that were saying it, that would be better. Independent historical confirmation. Somebody who's not religious who's writing outside of that forum. Or somebody who's not Christian. Somebody who's not Messianic, whatever. Somebody who's writing outside of that forum. And of course, you've got to have confirmation of that difference in the Hebrew Gospels that have survived today. Does that make sense? That that's that's good. That's that's good. Good uh, a good way to authenticate the the manuscript. Yes. Okay, that's pretty good, right? That's kind of ideal. All right. Let's look at one. The breaking of the lintel in the inner temple. In three instances, Jerome preserves evidence of a tradition in the early church. In the early church, he's fourth century. But he's talking about first century here, which says that it was the breaking of the lintel stone in the Holy of Holies that was recorded like when the, the crucifixion of Yeshua. There was an earthquake. You remember that part? Okay, so he says in the Hebrew Gospels, it was not the veil that was torn. It was the huge lintel stone above the veil that cracked and fell. All right? So then when I read this, <clears throat> Yehovah took me by the hand and said, now come over here to the Hebrew Gospels and look up those three verses. So I looked up those three verses. Every one of them spoke of the stones of the temple being broken. No mention of the veil. But remember what was hanging underneath the lintel stone. The veil was, right? So if the huge lintel stone cracked in half and fell, it's going to tear the veil. It's going to tear the veil in half. You see? So it's really not a contradiction. It is just a different perspective. The, the Greeks were using that as a theological point that the, the Holy of Holies has been wide open to them. Now they can have direct communication with Yehovah. They did not have to go through a Hebrew priest to get it. You with me? All right. To the, to the Messianics, many of whom had been in that temple, and really it was one of the wonders of the ancient world. It was demon-possessed, but it was one of the wonders of the ancient world. To them, that foreshadowing of the complete destruction of the temple, which happened in 40 years, 40 years from then, was by far the most important thing. Who cares about the curtain? The lintel stone, the huge lintel stone broke in half. That's desecrating the Holy of Holies, right? That's a powerful statement by Yehovah about the crucifixion of his son, Yeshua, you know, in which the Romans did it, but there were Jews that participated. The Herodian priests and Herod himself, they all participated in this. <clears throat> All right, so let's look at these. Matthew 27, 51. Now, in the King James, which is basically these days, it's just a straight translation from the Latin Vulgate. Okay. All right, so behold, the veil of the temple was rent in two in the Hebrew Gospels. And here the temple was broken on both sides up and down. And the earth quaked and the stones split in the middle. Talks about the stones of the temple, not the veil. Do you agree? Mark 15, 38. And the veil of the temple was rent in two from the top to the bottom. In the Hebrew Gospels, the temple was broken on both sides, up and down. From the front to the back, from the top to the bottom, the stones were split. In Luke 23, 45. In the King James, and the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent, was ripped in the middle. In the Hebrew Gospels, and the sun went dark and covered the temple, and it was split right down the middle. That's the inner temple, the Holy of Holies. Pretty good? All right, so we have a, we have a, uh, a very, very important event, the crucifixion event, that is mentioned by Jerome, and we find it in the Hebrew Gospels, just as Jerome said it would be, and it's from the first century church tradition that this was so. Okay, so that validates this as coming from the first century, at least in this aspect. 
So that must mean the rest of it must come from the first century too. So what other, what other validation do we have? In a book called the Historia Passionis Domini, the history of the passion of, the, of God, in the Gospel of the Nazarenes, that would be the Messianics, we read that at the time of Messiah's death, the lintel of the temple of immense size had split. Josephus says the same and adds that overhead, awful voices were heard which said, let us depart from this abode. So what was going on in that temple that was so demon possessed? Well, they were cheating the, the righteous people, the righteous Israelites. They'd come to the temple that they had to offer sacrifices at certain times for certain things. And they say, well, unfortunately, this goat has a blemish. However, for a small fee, we will accept this goat as a down payment, and we will sell you a goat that is without blemish. And so they'd get the goat and the price of the goat. They'd bring money to, to put in as a tithe, and they say, well, you can't have the, the likeness of any foreign you know, god, or, and the Caesars were considered, they considered themselves to be gods. But for a small fee, we will change your money into money that does not have such, a, such, an, such an idolatrous image on it. Okay? So they were, they were cleaning up, boy, they were cleaning up off the, the good people that came to the temple. That's demonic. Would you agree on, on that? That's really demonic. Okay. So, and of course, they didn't have any problem spending that money with the, the Caesar's image on it. <laughs> so that was written in there. So the breaking of the lintel as perversed by Jerome in the Hebrew Gospel is confirmed in all three verses of the HGC. And remember, the, the author of the Historia Passionis Domini, as well as Josephus, commented on this. So that's two additional sources to the Hebrew Gospels, two additional ancient sources. It's confirmed in all three verses of the Hebrew Gospels from Catalonia. Now we have a pattern, don't we? A pattern is a lot harder to deny the authenticity of. So we're going to fly forward to 2020. This is really a great story. Are you enjoying this? Yes. Good. I, I, I mean, I love this stuff. This is fabulous. And I'm not that smart. Yehovah Ye really handed all of this stuff to me. You know, he told me what to do. Any virtue that I have is that I listened at least that time and went and did what he asked me to do. So he gave me the, he gave me the inscriptions from Sinai. He gave me the Hebrew Gospels. He just go to go to Israel and find it. So I went and I found it. And he, he always makes it easy. It's like he hands it to you on a silver platter. At least me, he does. You don't have to fight for it or go through any kind of hassles or anything. You just, you do what he says, he just hands it to me. So I get to do the footwork, which is a pleasure with his guidance. You know, I have the skills so I can do the translations and stuff. So we're, trans we're flash forwarding to 2020, we ready? There'll be a blinding light, you'll go through a tunnel. It's <laughs> okay, there you go. Okay, remember I was sitting in my library with three, in my own study, with three copies of the, the Hebrew Gospels. Uh, two in Hebrew, one that was translated into Roman. I said, there's gotta be more. If, that, if I have three here in Kerrville, Texas, there's got to be more. So I, I went to, the my, I sent out a, a call to my list and they were, what I consider miraculous, they provided me a $10,000 to go find the underground Bibles in Europe. I didn't even know where to look. Well, yeah, you know, I had some clues. Uh, so I went there for 30 days on a blitz of the libraries in Europe. The first day, I went to the Cambridge University Library. I found four copies, four manuscripts of the Hebrew Bible. Two days later, I went to Manchester, England, and they had a fifth manuscript uh, from the same collection that had been shared with Manchester and, and Cambridge. So I recovered five, which was really incredible. And there were others. <clears throat> but these were discovered. The coaching Gospels had came from India. And remember St. Thomas went to India, and he established a church that lives to this day. The St. Thomas Christians are Messianic. They're Messianic Christians, right? And they, 
suffered so much oppression over that time. But th this is good because it, it has historical confirmation of what we found there, which is important. So how do you know it came from India? Well, there's historical confirmation. The Cochin Gospels, this is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But later on, I discovered not only did it have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they were on a title page, but it had the rest of the Brit Hadashah also, all the letters, all Revelation, everything in Hebrew, right? A complete compilation. Since then, we have found six complete compilations of the entire Brit Hadashah in Hebrew. Pretty good. I think that's good. Okay, the entire New Testament in Hebrew except Revelation, that was the second copy. The Revelation of John and the Gospel of John and then some of the letters, uh, Acts, Romans, Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, all in Hebrew. That was on the first day of the journey. Since then, since I've been talking about it on the media, they've started blossoming like flowers in the spring and part of that is because, is because of our, our putting it out there and myself as the director of the B'nai Manah Institute, which is translating these, uh, we're putting it out there, and so the word has gotten out, n not just by me, but we, we were certainly contributed to that. So the Cochin Hebrew Gospels, Ha Sefer Shal Evangeline. So this is the book of the Gospels, of the uh, evangelists. So you've got Beserot, uh, Hamathius, uh, Beserot ha Marcos, Beserot ha Luca, and Beserot ha John, Jan, Johan, Johanan. Beserot is the good news. This is the good news of Matthew, the good news of Luke, the good news of Mark, the good news of um, the good news of John. The provenance of it. These were manuscripts were found in the synagogue of the black Jews of Cochin, in their synagogue. And they were copied from an older manuscript into a newer, into a newer, than the, the square, the more modern square script of, of the Hebrew is written into today. And that was done in 1810. By the way, look back here at these. The second manuscript there listed on here is the copy that this was written from. So we have them both. All right, so we have that copy that it was written from. And it is a good bit older. <clears throat> Here's the first page of the Hebrew New Testament. Did not have a cover, so it got worn a bit, but it's readable. Here the the uh, page view from the epistles of the Hebrew New Testament, the letters, and they're listed over here. That's somebody else, obviously. These notes is the 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 manuscript page, the library uh, designation of this manuscript, 0 0.1.16. The manuscript, the Gospel of John, clearly in a different hand than the others, in a different hand script and the manuscript of Revelation, which we decided to do first because it is so relevant to our time today. We're gonna to do Revelation first, then the Gospels, all right? The problem, the problem is uh, we've got 85 manuscripts. <laughs> we have to read them, and, or at least as many as we can, and to take the best ones and compile them. So it's a lot bigger job than just taking one text and translating it into English. But all of, our, all of our books will come out, they'll have Hebrew and English. So they can be read by any Israeli. And we can do it in Hebrew, Spanish, Hebrew, French, Hebrew, Swahili, whatever. Okay. So they were received from, recovered from Cochin, India, and Kerala province. That is where St. Thomas went, to Cochin. That's where he established his church. According to Eusebius, the gospel, according to Matthew, had been taken to India by, by, by Thomas, certainly, but also a copy was taken by the Apostle Bartholomew. Was, what was their Bible? What was their scripture? 
It was the Hebrew Gospels. There were no Greek Gospels yet. Paul did start writing fairly early, and he wrote in Greek for the most part. But uh, the, what they had was the Tanakh and the Hebrew Gospels. That's what they had, and that's what they carried. They evangelized the whole world with the Hebrew, with the Hebrew books, with the Hebrew Tanakh, the Old Testament, and the Hebrew Gospels. All right, so I'm going to go back here. All right, so he preserved there that book until the visit of Pantanaeus. Now, this is in the second century. And Pantanaeus, he came from Alexandria, and he took a copy of Hebrew Matthew back with him on his return to Alexandria. There it was available in the time of Origen, who made a comparison of all the Old Testament, but he had the work of the Hebrew Gospels to use in that study in his hexapla comparison of all the Hebrew and Greek Gospels extant at the time. Okay, so these are, all these people are talking about these Gospels that we have. You see how that adds strength to it? The ancients said these manuscripts were there and we have them. So if you're going to say they are whatever, just a translation from the Greek, you got a lot, you got a lot to explain. Now, back to the authentication of the Hebrew Gospels, our regularly scheduled programming. Okay, so what do these say? We just authenticated the Hebrew Gospels from Catalonia as coming from a first century source because of these three verses in Matthew, Mark, and Luke which talk about the, the lintel stone being split rather than the veil. So what does it say in the Cochin Gospels? This is what it says. In the translation of Cochin Gospel of Matthew 27, 51, and suddenly the face of the entry of the temple was split in two. That would be the big stone over the top, the lintel stone. Was split in two from the beginning until the end, and the earth shook and the heavens were hidden. That sounds like the lintel being stone being split, doesn't it? Mark 1538, and the entry to the temple cracked after the start of the quake. Luke 23, 45, it was dark and split the entry of the temple right down the middle. Two manuscripts separated by 2,000 years and 5,000 miles, and they say the same thing. How do you like them apples? Is that good? Puts a lock on the authenticity of the Hebrew Gospels, if it's true, of course. Now, that is a, it is a big deal but do we have any other evidence that this is what happened? Well, the, you know, that same question applies to all the other phenomena that the, around the crucifixion, right? The darkening, the darkness over the temple, right? The earthquake. Were all of those things, any of those things? The tearing of the veil as well. Were any of those things reported, right? By, by other people at the time. Well, This is a report from the Talmud, I believe. The outer walls of the temple concealed the damage to the Holy of Holies. But the chamber of Yun Stone, housing the Sanhedrin Council only 40 yards away, was so structurally damaged by the earthquake that the Sanhedrin had to vacate the prestigious chamber and it was never reoccupied. That was in the same earthquake. All right? Remember what I said. Chamber of Yun Stone, 40, 40 yards away from the Holy of Holies, was so structurally damaged that they couldn't use it anymore because it's likely to fall any minute. With me? So they moved. So according, this is the quote from the Talmud. From 40 years before the destruction of Jerusalem Temple, the Sanhedrin was removed from the Chamber of Yun Stones in the Temple and reconvened in the marketplace. Mm -hmm very prestigious, the marketplace. So the Talmud tells us when the Sanhedrin ceased to judge capital offenses, that was in the time of, uh, of Yeshua's ministry. They moved from the chamber of Yunstones to the marketplace. 
40 years before the destruction of the Jerusalem temple was the most momentous year in history. That was the one year ministry of Yeshua. The temple was destroyed on the 9th of, of Aviv in 70 AD by Titus, later become Caesar, and putting down a rebellion. <clears throat> The month of Aviv, Nisan, in the new calendar is the month of Passover. That year, from Passover 30 AD to Passover 31 AD, encompassed Yehuva, Yeshua the Messiah's one-year ministry and his crucifixion. I know you've heard it's three and a half years, but that was invented by Eusebius in the fourth century. The year of Messiah's crucifixion was the very year of the crucifixion that the Jews were denied the right to perform capital punishment. Because, of course, anybody that opposed them, they would just kill them, right? You know, churches as well as governments, they always tend to go toward totalitarianism. They want more power. Okay, I know we, I, I hate to think that about the churches, but unfortunately history proves me wrong. Churches as well as governments, they want more power it's not about salvation in many of the periods of time in the churches of all kinds. It's about power. Um, and there, look, there have been saintly leaders of every church. Mm, really saintly leaders. But then there have been others. Right? They were not so saintly. They were far more interested in power than salvation. Power and money and things of that nature. Right? Mm. So they replied when they brought Yeshua before them to Pilate. He told them, take him and judge him by your law. And they said, well, it's not lawful for us to put anyone to death. See, the Romans had already taken them away from it because they had so abused it, they took that authority away from the Sanhedrin. So they had to get Pontius Pilate to do it. So Herod came, Herod came out and played a really good game. Well, I don't find any fault with them washing his hands of it. So he gets, got away, he gets away from it. So according to Luke 22:66, the daybreak trial where Yeshua was condemned to death for blasphemy, for claiming to be the Son of God, took place in the Sanhedrin council chamber of the temple. It was the last judgment they would ever render there. According to the record, the judgment made by the official Sanhedrin against Jesus within the chamber of Yunstan was the last judgment ever given by the official Sanhedrin. In those, they were majestic chambers too. Yehovah himself gave testimony to Yeshua as the Son of God by covering the temple in darkness, causing an earthquake to break the stones, cracking the walls of the inner temple, the Holy of Holies, splitting the lintel, rending the veil in two, desecrating the Holy of Holies forever, and rendering the Sanhedrin chamber unusable. As for the Sanhedrin, from that day forward, they deliberated over the law in the marketplace to the smell of manure and the bleeding of sheep. <laughs> Serves them right. They never were able to reoccupy it. And in 40 years, 40 years after his execution, it was completely destroyed. So this was a foreshadowing of that event that was going to happen. Yeshua himself prophesied that, as did Daniel. They were, the apostles were showing him the temple and they were all excited. I mean, really, it was an awesome structure. There's no doubt about that. I mean, it was inlaid with gold on the inside. I mean, it was incredible, right? Yeshua was not impressed with the building. Can you believe that? He was not impressed with the building. I wish it'd take him down to the higher regency in Springfield or something. Wow, it's got that big lobby, a huge lobby and a stream flowing through it. He'd be impressed with that, right? No, Yeshua was not impressed with the building, no matter how majestic. What did he say? You probably all know this. See that? Not one stone is going to be left upon another. It's temporary. Whatever we build is temporary. Only his father, Yehovah, is eternal. That's what changes our lives. Not this presentation, but our opening ourselves up to the Spirit. You know, he said that. And 40 years later, the Romans burnt the temple. What happened to all that gold plate? It melted and it ran between the stones. And the scavengers literally pulled every rock away from every other to scavenge the gold that had melted and gone down the cracks. Awesome, huh? 
That was Yeshua's, it was Yeshua's call. <clears throat> the destruction was total, exactly 40 years later. I'm sorry, I get ahead of myself. <clears throat> Another one of the markers of the Hebrew Gospel, John 1, 1 says, in the Hebrew Gospels, typically, it says, in the beginning, in the KGV, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the Hebrew Gospels, it says, in the beginning was the Son, and the Son was with God, and the Son was God. In the Hebrew Gospels from Catalonia, it says, in the beginning was the Son, Eloah, and the Son of El was with El. That's in the Hebrew Gospel. And we find that, we find that. See, this is, how we find, this is how we tell whether a new manuscript is authentic or not. We look at these things, these markers, from the other, from the other manuscripts that we've already authenticated. Here's one that's very important, Matthew 121, and you shall call his name Yeshua, for he shall save his people. In Hebrew, that would be, you shall call his name Yeshua, for he shall Yoshia his people. Same root word. Yeshua means salvation. So this is what is called, it's called paranomosia. It's often called Hebrew word puns, but it's not meant to be funny. It's meant to be memorable. It's meant to rhyme. It's internal rhyme. It's meant to be memorable. Usually it's lost in translation, right? So if you've got it in the Hebrew, you know it's kind of, it's authentic, right? You with me on that? Because usually that sort of thing, poetry doesn't survive in translation because the words don't rhyme anymore, right? Okay, but remember that. Yoshia, the word save, salvation, uh, to save, comes from the same root as Yeshua, which means salvation, right? How about that? Okay, this is, um, we're gonna come back to that in a moment, but I want to tell you my favorite story about the Hebrew Gospels, all right? The Hebrew Gospels, Remember, they were trying to eliminate the name of God from them, so they tweaked it. They, they, they have tweaked the Gospels. The Greeks did do that. And it takes my breath away, frankly, to see these things that you would, anyone would dare to tweak the Word of God. It, really, I mean, the hubris of it just blows my mind. But they did. Remember, it's about power, not salvation. That's why we have to get back to the Hebrew Gospels, the original Word, right? Because they're different. And here's a really good example of that. Remember when Yeshua returns from the dead, it's the last chapter, it's the last page of Matthew. And uh, he meets his followers on the road, and he says to them, he says, God is our salvation. And like a version of that is, Yehovah Yoshiahenu. You know, God, Yehovah, is our salvation. Okay, actually that means Yehovah is our Yeshua. Did you know that? Because Yeshua is the word for salvation. So he's saying to them, Yehovah is our Yeshua. Very interesting, isn't it? All right, well, the Greeks were eliminating the name of God from the Bible, and so they didn't want a greeting that had the name of God in it, so they tossed it and they put in a standard Greek and Roman greeting, all hail. This is a military salute, actually, and you, and you do it by slamming your fists against your breastplate and thrusting it in the air. All hail! Does that remind you of anything? Adolf Hitler was a big fan of Mussolini. He adopted the Roman military salute as the Nazi salute. So isn't it just a little bit comforting to know that when Yeshua returned from the dead, he did not greet his followers with the Nazi salute? I mean, really, isn't that kind of comforting? You know, when you change the word, the consequences, well, for your soul is going to be horrible, but for other people that read it down the line, you don't know what it's going to do. You think you're doing something right, and I should know, because I mean, I am in the position of having to uh, figure out what was the original thing that was said and putting it down, right? And I know that I will, I will be judged by God for what I do. Right, so I'm, I'm praying every time I do it, let your voice be here on this page, not mine. Uh, 
So it's, I mean, it's, it's not a small thing. So I'm really stunned when I come across these examples of people tweaking the Bible, manipulating the wording. And it, it, uh, just to let you know, it doesn't change the story. You know, Yeshua is still the Son of God. He still did all those miraculous things we read about, right? So it, it's nothing that should shake anybody's faith. It does not change the basic story. What it does is these are usually things that are added in to support a certain doctrine, you know, a doctrine of the church. So they're fairly easy to read and to find and, and to recognize, right? And this is an example. And they wanted to eliminate the name of God, so boom, they did. And they used all hail, which kind of backfired, didn't it? Okay, so here's one of those, one of those particular greetings is Yehovah Yeshua Henu. God is salvation. Yehovah is our Yeshua. How cool is that, really? Sukkot. Let's go back to Sukkot. We're, I know we're going back in time again. Blinding light through the tunnel. We're back in 30 AD now at Sukkot, right? At the climax of the week-long festival of tabernacles, the high priest in procession goes to the pool of Siloam. Yeah, it's a big deal. You know, they're blowing flutes and lutes and harps and everything and swinging incense and they're all dressed up in their fine stuff. And it's just a long parade, procession. They go down to the pool of Siloam. As it says in Isaiah, they pull the Mayane Ha Yeshua, the springs of salvation. They pull the water from there. Okay? The spring of salvation. So this becomes the water of salvation. The, or, or in Hebrew, the water of Yeshua. Okay, they take it back to the, you know, to the temple. Remember the lutes and the, the, the harps and the, the cymbals and the drums. and It's a big parade, right? So they parade back to the temple. And the climatic moment of Sukkot, they will add red wine to the water of Yeshua. And it now becomes the blood of Yeshua. Red wine is symbolic of blood in religious, Jewish religious ceremony. And they pour the blood of Yeshua onto the seat, the judgment seat in the Ark of the Covenant. And everyone says in one voice, gathered from all over the world, every, this is one of the three feasts where you're required to go to Jerusalem for. And they all shout in one verse, Yehovah Yoshia Henu. You want to say it with me? Yehovah Yoshia Henu. Yehovah Yoshia Henu. Yehovah is our Yeshua. Well, Satan had to get rid of that, right? I mean, this is what this is what happens. So that's one of the things that had to be tweaked. So, let's ask the question again that we asked at the first of the presentation. Does it matter whether the Gospels are written in Hebrew or Greek? Does it matter? Yes. Only if you care about the truth of Scripture. Then it matters enormously. Everything we know about our Messiah comes to us through the Greek filter of a different language, culture, and thought. Right? So on the last and greatest day of the festival, Yeshua stood and said in a loud voice, remember this is 30 AD. Remember the tunnel and the blinding light? Sukkot, 30 AD. This year, just as they were pouring the blood of Yeshua onto the mercy seat, and the whole nation, just before, the whole nation was saying, Yehovah Yeshua Henu, there was this one guy that was full of chutzpah. This young man stood up and said, let all who thirst come to me, and I will give you living water flowing out of the core of your being. Who was that guy? That was our Messiah. Right? That was our Messiah. So when we search for the truth of the word, we need to go back to the Hebrew perspective, do we not? Amen. 
The day following Sukkot was called Shemini Atzeret, and on this day the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in the act of adultery. Didn't bring the man, though. Usually it takes two. Yeah. All right. More or less demanding that you should condemn her to be stoned to death as prescribed by Mosaic law, that they might have something to accuse him. They usually, they usually didn't be that harsh, but he wanted them to. They wanted to get something on him. And I think you all know the story. This is probably the most well-known and popular parable that Yeshua did during his ministry, right? Wouldn't you probably agree? The woman caught in adultery. What did he do? He bent down and drew in the dirt and the dust on the temple floor. <clears throat> John 8, 1 through 11 is called the wandering parable. Do you know this was not in the earliest Greek manuscripts? It was not in the first, the earliest hundred Greek manuscripts. It was not in the earliest 200 Greek manuscripts. It was not in the earliest 263 Greek manuscripts. It was not added into the gospel, into the Greek gospel, until 500. That would be like the sixth century, really incredibly late. And it was added in because it was in the Hebrew gospel. And they had preserved it. How do we know that? Because the early church fathers say so. They say it came from the Hebrew Gospel. So you can thank the Messianics who preserved the Hebrew Gospel for that parable being written in. So is it sacred word? Absolutely. How do I know that? It was in the Hebrew Gospel. The earliest, most authentic. Even Jerome called it the authentic fountainhead of the word. Right? Because everything gets changed every time you make another copy. Something gets changed. The Greeks were apparently not terribly good scribes, right? So he said, you have to go back to the authentic fountain of the word, the Hebrew Gospels, if you want to get the truth. And those, the Hebrew Gospels, were used to resolve disputes in what, how the canon, canon, canonical Gospels should be written. So they went up to the women. Remember, they were, they were in the temple they were in the temple courtyard. This is where judgments like this were done. But you kind of miss that if you don't know it. But they went in the Mount of Olives and they went into the temple and Yeshua stooped down and wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. He that is without sin among you casts the first stone. This is what he said to them. And the Pharisees slinked away. Why did they do that? A lot of paper and ink has been used Probably forests full of trees have been cut down to provide the paper, you know, to write up different explanations of what happened. You probably, you probably have a few versions yourself. But the real version is this one. They would take, when they did a judgment like this, they would take a goblet of red wine, which symbolizes blood, right? Symbolizes blood. In this case, the blood of the prophets, the prophets of Yehovah. They would take some dust from the courtyard, right, where the prophets had tread, where the prophets had walked. And they would take it and they would sprinkle it into the blood, right? And you would swear, I think you would drink of it. We, we swear by putting our hand on a Bible in, in our courtroom. They swore in this fashion. I think you would drink some of it. You would, you would swear by the blood of Jehovah's prophets to the truth of your statements, right? <clears throat> so every Jew there knew exactly what Yeshua was doing. He was preparing the chalice for the oath. All he had to do was call for a goblet of wine. It would have, it would have been there. And the Pharisees didn't wait for that. They were not willing to swear to the veracity of what they were doing. All right, so they just snuck away. Because they were still afraid of God. They were believers. Every Hebrew knew what it meant. Every Hebrew knew what it meant. The priest was preparing the chalice, where they prepared to swear under penalty of death 
that what they had said about catching her in the act of adultery was true. Yeshua didn't say she was innocent. He said, go and sin no more. The parable of the woman taken in adultery is included in the canon of scripture on the authority of the Hebrew gospel where it survived. It was finally published in the Greek text in the sixth century. Thank you very much. Now, we, we are at an, an end of the presentation. So if you have to go, do not feel bad about it. But I will stay here and answer anybody's questions. Please buy some books when you got. That's how we, that is how we finance our ministry. Because there, you know, we've got about 100 people all over the world. Uh, one of them is here in Ava. His name is Nathan Swayze. Do you know him? You do? How about that? Is he here? Is that Nathan? Hot dog. <laughs> Good. So glad, Nathan. So glad you're here. I've had to travel pretty far to meet some of our people, but I'm really glad you're here. So can we have a round of applause for Nathan, who's one of our tireless, our tireless workers that we train, and they become specialists in different things, and so we, without them, we wouldn't be able to do this. 85 manuscripts. I won't live long enough to get all this translated, but with the help of our team of dedicated people, we will. So it's, it's a great thing. So yeah, buy some books and uh, subscribe to our, our YouTube channel, Writing of God. That will send you notice whenever we put something out and put your name down on our list so we can contact you next time we come back here and you can show up for another presentation. We've got one, one that I really love to give are the 17 major accomplishments of the Messianic Church throughout the last 2,000 years. Remember, the Messianic Church was written off in the fifth century. Oh, they disappeared, they went away. Nobody knows where they went. Well, actually, they never went away, and they accomplished major, major things during that time. I mentioned a couple of them. Christopher Columbus was a Messianic, so was St. Patrick, a Messianic. The Celtic Church was a thing of beauty. It was incredible, daily miracles, just like the early apostles. You know, because he was, he was, he was Jewish Christian, you know, by blood, you know, and his church was a Messianic church. The Reformation Bibles, the Waldensians preserved those, and that were, they were the source of the Reformation Bibles. Just more stuff than I have time to 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 tell you about here, but it's a great presentation. Um, questions, comments, Hebrew jokes, anything. Yes, ma'am, Hannah, right? Yeah. Are you familiar with the book, The Other 1492? Yes. Uh -huh. Okay. It coincided with what you were sharing. Oh, yeah. It's, it's a great a it's, book. It's a really well done book. They've come out with more, like 1493, right, you know, other. A really well done piece of history. Mm. What translations from the Hebrew do you recommend? Are, are, do you have one? Yeah. We, the first book we put out is James because some of our team just like that, and so they did it, and it's a rather small book. It was easy to get together. We have them on the book table out there. Okay. Uh, the Shem Tov manuscript was uh, translated by he, uh, George Howard, okay. and that's available on the internet. You can find it, and uh, that's it. Okay. Well, recently they've done a couple of translations from the Hebrew Gospels from Catalonia. Now, I just want to warn you, uh, I talked to those people. I thought they might want to work with us, and they said their main reason for doing it was to replace the name of God in those with Yahweh. Okay, well, I informed them that that is not in anywhere in that manuscript. You can't do that, or you're, you're doing the same thing we accused the Greeks of doing, changing the Bible to suit your bias. Amen. Uh, but they went ahead and did it anyway, so we parted on that, on that basis. So it's not a very good translation, but they're out there. You can find them. Um, so, and now that we've gotten the Hebrew Gospels out there, I, there's more people that are working on them. Um, some are good, some are bad. Some are just soliciting donations on the internet. Some aren't. I hate to say that, but there are people imitating our work and our research and using it to, you know, to get money. And uh, so, 
you should be warned. You know, you're supposed to be truth seekers. Question, question everything. Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Well, are we, can we expect from what you've done to get a whole New Testament from the Hebrew? Yes. Now, we're going to publish some book by book as they come out to get them out there as fast as we can. But yes, once we get all the Gospels done and Acts, we're going to compile those in a Gospels uh, book. And then when we get them all done, we'll put it all in a complete compilation. But we'll have them archived online so you can go through each and every one of these 85 manuscripts that we have done uh, and see what they say. You can look at our work, uh, agree, disagree, comment, criticize. So it will be the, the place to go to do research in the Hebrew New Testament for those of you that uh, want to do it. So we'll have it in our archives. Uh, there'll be a subscription fee, but you know, it'll be reasonable. And you'll have all this available. Uh, just to kind of follow up on what he was saying um, or asking, do you guys have a certain timeline? I guess that would be my first question uh, when these books might be available. And mm. the second question, not that I think too much of modern scholarship, but how has your research and findings been received, um, I guess, from the mainstream? Thanks. How, say what, I missed the last part. How has our research done what? How, how has it been received? Um, just from the mainstream, you know, okay. scholarship. I got it, yeah, yeah. Uh, pretty much as we'd expected. You know, it's called Greek Primacy of the Bible. It is a article of faith within the, within the modern Christian church, and the old one as well. It's called Replacement Theology. We are the new Israel. Everything that was the Jews is now ours. You know, because they killed God, Yeshua. Uh, it's a sin that cannot be expiated, so they're banned to to hell, right? Okay, we're, we're, we're the top dog now. So it's a new religion. You can see that. Once you start looking, you can see it's a new religion, and they purposely change it from the old Judaic religion, and that's the thing that is so troubling. Replacement theology is a part of that. It's also called supersessionism. Okay, but what did Yeshua say? Did he say, that's the old God, I'm the new one? So ignore that guy behind the cloud. Did he say that? No. no, he didn't say that. He said that Father is greater than I am. The one. That's who I pray to. That's who I get my marching orders from, right? He put it all back to the Father. The commandments were the Father's. The Torah was the Father's, right? That's what he said. But the new church is creating that there are two. This is, this is the problem here, OK? You've got. You've got a uh, Yeshua HaMashiach and Jesus Christ are the same historical person. Okay, let's get that straight. They are the same historical person. But they're archetypes. The archetype is the way we see them, our perception of them, who they were, what their message was, what their goals are, is entirely different from the Hebrew Yeshua to the Greek Jesus. The Hebrew Yeshua upheld Torah. Uh, that Yod or Tittle will be taken from the law. Right? The Greek Jesus is said to have done away with it. He has fulfilled the law. It's over. Right? Done with. Those cannot be reconciled, those two view, those two perceptions. So it's an archetype, right? And the archetype is not the person. It's the way we see it, what we're told about them. There's a big difference between those two. So you have medieval priests that are torturing fellow congregants that are Messianic believers, right? In the name of Yeshua, in the name of Jesus, right? Jesus wants us to torture and kill these people, right? So the, the, that's all, it's a power thing, right? Anyone who doesn't think like us or agree with us or bow down to our church and our doctrine, we have the right to kill them. Where does that come from? I'll give you a Bible study if you would like to take up the challenge. You know the parable of the talents, right? It's in Matthew, it's in, it's in Mark. No, it's in Matthew and it's in Luke, excuse me. 
Luke was done by the Greeks. They added three verses into the parable of the talents, turned it into a completely different story. What do you know about the parable of the talents? He's saying, look, you've been given these gifts. All right? You've been given salvation. You've been given these gifts. And yet, you don't want to share with your fellows. Right? So, that's why... You know, the one who received five talents and earned five talents more. It's like, you, it's like you've been cured of cancer. Okay? Let's take an analogy that's a little easier to understand. You've been cured of cancer. You're going to die of cancer. You've been cured of cancer. And all that is asked of you, take this vial of this miracle cure and cure someone else of cancer that's suffering. So to one was given five vials. To another was given three vials. And to another who was given one vial. And the one who was given five vials, he, he saved the lives of five people. He gave them the cure. And the one who was given three vials saved the lives of three people. But the one who was given one was fearful. I guess he didn't want to, or lazy. And he didn't cure anyone. Right? So that's why it says in there, to those who have, more will be given. To those who don't have, even the little that they have may be taken away from them. You, know, you think you can sit on the couch and not ever do anything that Yeshua has commanded us to do and your ticket is stamped for heaven? You gotta stand in front of the throne of God and say, what have you done with your life? Well, I'm really good at bowling and golf. You know, yeah. What are you going to tell them that you haven't done anything? What do you expect them to say? I don't know. I don't know how he's going to judge you. I really don't. But I do know that he expects you to share your salvation, to share whatever you have, to pray. Don't ever be afraid to pray with somebody. Don't just don't be afraid of it. You know. It doesn't matter who you are, whether you're, you're not a great saint. I am not a great saint, but I will pray with anybody. You know, we don't save anybody. The Holy Spirit saves people. Yeshua saves people. We just pray for them, right? We call down the power from heaven and ask them to accept it and receive it. So it's God that does that, not us. So don't ever worry about that. Just pray for people. So why do we wear make zit seats? Why do we why do we wear those? Because people will stop us on the street every day and say, "What's that all about?" <laughs> you get to testify ten times a day to other people, right? So that was the, that was the thing. This this parable of the talents got tweaked by the Greeks. Matthew was written in Hebrew, Luke was written in Greek, and they added three words in there. This is what it is. This is what they are. Just to make it brief. Um, a lord went away to another kingdom, to, to, an, uh, to a far distant place to receive his kingdom and then returned. All right, these are the three insertions. But his citizens hated him and would not that he would rule over them. And they sent a letter to that king saying so. This is not in Matthew. Matthew is the original gospel. Nothing like this is in Matthew. Matthew is the pure parable of the talents. But in Luke, at the end, then it goes to the regular story about the talents, all right? But then at the end, Yeshua, out of his mouth, in the Bible, it's in red letters, must be true, right? He says, as for those who would not have me reign over them, bring them here and slay them before me with the sword. Is that your Yeshua? Is that our Savior? We know it was an addition into the Bible. It's not in Matthew the original Hebrew gospel. It's not there. In fact, it takes 30 verses. Doesn't mention that. Mark takes 15. Uh, Luke does. Takes 15 to tell the same story, but adds in these three verses. And that was one of them. This is the verse that the church uses to justify their authority to kill anyone that disagrees with them. You see how this works? Pretty insidious, isn't it? And in the, in the same in the same book, 
Mark says, I did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. So when they redid the Bibles in the 1800s, they took that out. It doesn't fit with the other thing, right? So they took that out. So there are omissions and there are additions, right? This is how they manipulate the word to fit doctrine. Like I said, just when I see that happening, the Bible is tapping back and it's like, oh, this is, this is horrible. I can't believe anyone would dare to do this. I would not want to be in their shoes. Okay, but you, I would like for you to do that Bible study and see what you think. You may think completely different. You may think I'm full of it, but you will find those things in the parable of the talents in Luke. Luke did not write them. They were done by later Greek editors. I know Luke, personally. <laughs> he would not write that. He'll read his gospel. He, he doesn't, that's not him writing it. So we know that the, we know that the Greeks rewrote his gospel because it doubled in size. So uh, anyway, I'm going to leave you with that unless there's anybody else with a burning question. Uh, timeline, um, you said you were working on Revelation first. When, when do you uh, think that'll be out? I'd like to get that out this year. Uh, personally, I'd rather get it out yesterday. Yeah, me too. <laughs> but uh, we're probably going to put a book out on the letters of Jesus and his brothers, James and John. And that will include, so what are the letters of Jesus? Anyone know? Did you know that Yeshua wrote letters? No. Didn't? Did you miss it? Yeah, Revelation. <laughs> he did. Those were his words, his letters, and they went out to the church, to the, to the seven churches. Okay, but his brothers, James and Jude, wrote fantastic, fantastic uh, epistles. Uh, and his brother James also wrote what is kind of, it's kind of a clunky title, but it's the Proto-Evangelion of James. So he tells us about the childhood story. Only Matthew and Luke talk about the childhood. His, his, the, so Proto, it means before, before his ministry. So it talks about him before his ministry. And I, I, do, I believe this is a completely authentic book and it's out there. So we're going to include it in there. It answers some very important doctrinal questions uh, about things in scripture. Questions? Gabriel Roth has the uh, Aramaic uh, New Testament. Are you familiar with him? I have it on my shelf. What's that? Uh, no, I've got Andrew Roth's Aramaic. And Andrew Roth, that's, that's who I'm, yeah. The Aramaic, he, he, he uh, says that the Aramaic was maybe the original written maybe, are you familiar with any of those manuscripts? I'm familiar with those manuscripts. And what do you uh, I'm think I'm familiar of that? with that argument. Uh, Aramaic was extremely important. It was used widely all over the Middle East, but it was not the first, Hebrew was the first. They don't have the evidence to back that up. You know, they, they say that. But remember, there's Greek primacy, there's Hebrew primacy, there's Latin primacy, there's Aramaic primacy. You know, what's the truth? The truth is the Hebrew was first. Aramaic came very quickly afterwards, and it was massively influential, very important. But as far as we can tell, pretty much, it is a translation from the Greek. I'm sure somebody could argue that, and maybe it was written, maybe successfully, but it still wasn't the first. But that, that's a great book. It's worth it just for the appendix. It's got the 613 mitzot, commandments, and I would recommend everybody get this. In fact, we printed it up. We'll probably have it on our website for free because I think every one of us, we, we're Torah followers, are we not? Okay, so this tells you the 613 commandments. Some of them are no longer applicable. It's got those marked. And some of them, about 75%, 75% are observed by, by Christians, but there's some that aren't. So I, I would suggest you go through every single one of those and decide whether you, you know, that's applicable to today and what you should be doing, should you be observing that. Okay, here's one that you probably, here's one that I left my tzitzit at home. <laughs> so I'm not wearing them, but uh, I do wear them. I do have them. Um, 
Another one that you probably are not aware of, it, it tells you to declare the Sabbath day. I declare the Sabbath day to be holy. And then at the end of it, I declare the Sabbath day to be holy. So why do you do that? Well, it, you're more likely to treat the Sabbath day as holy once you declare it as such, right? And it also gives you some control. You, you declare it. So if you want to go six to six, you can do that. You want to go seven to seven, you can do that. If you want to wait till the sun goes down at 9.30 to eat, you can do that. You know, you can do 9.30 to 9.30, right? So you, it gives you the control to, to, to bring in the Sabbath day. It's kind of hard because if you're in Alaska and it does, the sun doesn't ever go down, then you're, you're in trouble. So you, you, obviously something has to be there, and apparently that was something they thought about even that far back. So you should declare it. It matters. God said to do it, so we, I do it. You know. So I want you to look at those and, and see, and then there's a kutub at the end, which is your, your vow that you will do everything that Yehovah has said. So, uh, but you need to read all of those before you sign that thing. Uh, all right, that would be my counsel. Yes. Uh, you were talking about the Waldensians. Yes. Um, the landmark Baptist churches would say the landmark is not messianic, but are baptistic in in their faith. So, what do you say about that? What What did you say they were baptistic? Yeah, in? baptistic in their faith. That's What's what that? the Baptists would say because Baptists would go back to history yeah, they and say that the Waldensians uh -oh. and, uh, and some other groups. The, the Baptists say, we, we, came, we came even before Jesus because we're followers of John the Baptist. All right, well, we came before all of those because our church goes back to creation. All right, so if they did not ever, if their church never repented of the great apostasy of declaring the Messianic church heretic and then proceeding to, to hunt them to extinction and burn all their scriptures, then they're not messianic. So, you know, how hard is it to say that, okay, it was wrong historically for the church to hunt the messianics to extinction and burn their scripture. Is that hard for anybody here to say? And I repent of it, because there is a certain generational burden that goes on. I repent of it. I'm not going to let I'm, I'm not going to let that stand. I'm, not, I'm going to stand up for it, right? Like you, if, if you're a pen of anti-Semitism, you stand up for the Hebrews, right? So there is a certain, it's not that you did those things, but there is a carryover if you still believe those things, if you're still trying to cover them up, or you've still, you still got the same attitude. Because they, they, they killed and dispossessed Messianics and the church profited from that. So that profit comes down to you. Yes, ma'am. Um, do, do you think there will be a third temple? Yeah, it says so. <laughs> it says there will be. And okay, so here's, here's, here's the kicker is that they, they already have the property. It was a, it, people are thinking it was on the top of the mount. They actually, that was Fort Antonina that was at the top of the Temple Mount. This is a Roman fort. It says, when Paul was being arrested, they came down from the temp They came down from the fort to the temple. It's down at the Pool of Siloam. That was my next question. Yeah, so that would be. Do you think that that's where the Temple Mount, where the, or do you think that that the uh, actual temple was was built? over like the Gion Springs? That's my understanding that it was built down there so they could have the living water. Yeah. You know, at the, at the spring of Gihon there. Uh, it, you know, I could be wrong, but you know, it, from what I know about it, that's where the temple was, was and uh, that's where it, so they already, they already own that property. Israel does. You know, the, the Muslims own the stuff on top. You're talking about starting a war if you put it there. But that's not where it originally was, right? Questions, comments? Hi. Yeah. Uh, what was on the inscription at the Jabal Makla for in the Proto Sinaitic, I assume? Oh, what was on it? There, was, there are a number of inscriptions. What, there. what, did, what were some of the? Um, one of mentions? them, one of them reads, uh, 
died Amalek, one reads died um, Hagar, one reads died Amaya Bat Hagar, and these were all found in a grouping, and, and these were near the mountain, it's kind of on the periphery of the camp. So that's the story that comes straight out of, of, of Exodus. You know, the Amalekites were preying on them, and so apparently this, this Amalekite was caught and killed, but he still managed to kill these two women, um, Hagar and her daughter, Amaya. And that was found by Jim and Penny? Yes, originally? it was. Across the, the street from the mountain, where the campsite is, or? Um, what, say that again? Well, so the, you know, the mountain's on sort of the west side of that little road that they have made there, and then the campsite was on the eastern side where the wadi is. I did not find those inscriptions when I was there six weeks ago, so I can't tell you Oh, that. they're still there then? I don't know. Okay, because I was wondering. I do believe some of them have been, been taken and destroyed. Yeah, so I was looking for. Because they didn't want it. Now they the want it because it's a tourist attraction, but they didn't want it at a time, and I do yeah. think some of them. Is the there any photographic are. evidence of that? Well, we found new, yeah, the, awesome. the Caldwells and, and others have, have photographed them, but <clears throat> We found, we did find new inscriptions. We went there to do an archeological survey and we did, and we found new inscriptions and we found new footprints that had not been recorded before. So it was, and we discovered some really amazing things. Yeah, that's looking forward to seeing that. And then uh, as far as the, uh, the mention of uh, the drawing into the dust uh -huh. and gathering the dust into the chalice, where's the historical uh, source of that, like is it Talmud or is it other sources? I'm trying to remember the, uh, the name of the book, of the author that wrote the book, and it doesn't come to me, but it is in the biography of the book where I talk about that. That would be Sons of Zion versus Sons of Greece. Okay, thank you. Just trying to remember, it doesn't come to me right I get now, because yes. I'm old and feeble. <laughs> okay, any others? I'm, uh, you know, I'm happy to stay here and answer your questions as long as Tom will keep the place open. So go ahead, go ahead and ask away. All right, thank you. Um, I was hoping maybe you could give me some additional context before uh, the Hebrew. I really appreciate where you're looking at the, the story where Yeshua uh, brought the, the adulterous woman because I, I had a little bit of a theory related to that and I wanted to know if there was anything in the Hebrew itself that might reveal something that might be potentially very powerful and uh, I, I, I seem to think that the wording is going to be very important there in the Hebrew because it says that he reached down and he wrote, I don't know if he said it in the dust, does it specifically say dust? And that's my question, and here's why I think that's important, because if, if he was in the outer courtyard, it would have been those giant stones. It would, my theory is that there, there wouldn't have been any dust at all there. It would have been completely clean. They would have been very adamant about that being a very clean place. Have you ever been to Israel? Well... I see the it's rows dusty. that people walk, but <laughs> why I'm, I'm, I'm asking that question is because it, it reminds me of an opportunity to think about when Moshe came down from the mount, his original, original tablets were written in the stone. Mm -hmm. So my theory was is that Yeshua being, uh, you know, the, the arm of Yah being the one to actually perform his actions, um, that he potentially would have been the one to write the tablet and not himself. So therefore, when he wrote in the uh. in the stone itself, he might have potentially literally just written, you know, keep, you know, y'all holy. I've heard that. And I, that I've heard that. There's, love, a, there's a lot of speculation himself. about what he might have written if he was writing. Uh, then that's one of them. He wrote the Ten Commandments. So, so it, it, kind of, it really kind of makes me think about that because, you know, here you had all these people standing around, they, like you said, they started to slurk off, and it reminds me of, you know, when, when Jonah was told um, to, uh, you know, speak to the worshipers of Dagon, you know, what did ultimately he want them to do? He wanted them to all be destroyed because he would call them their enemies, and then I think of these people, they, they didn't want this woman to be innocent. They wanted to stone her to death, and they wanted Yeshua to be the one to do it, but therefore, when he said you need to love your neighbor as yourself, Obviously, they all left, and it reminds me of the, the prophecy of messianic prophecy, where it says that you know, Yeshua would be in the belly of the earth, like uh, Jonah was in the uh, belly of the well for three days, and just it just ties it all together for me. But that's obviously just a theory. But I just wanted to know, like, with actual Hebrew words, would there be any context with it in itself 
that might be hidden there because it doesn't obviously say explicitly based on the Greek. I studied that and I don't remember, I remembered that I didn't find anything I thought unusual. I don't remember exactly what the words were. Sure. But I did study that. But that is one of the things that's been suggested. And I don't know, he may have been writing something, but I believe that they, they knew that he could call for a judgment any time. And, and by drawing in the dust, it made everybody aware. Because that's what you did. You took a chalice of red wine, put the dust from where the prophets had walked, and, and you swore by that. That was their Bible that they swore on when they did a judgment. So I think that is the correct Hebrew perspective on the, on the issue. But it's certainly possible he could have been drawing something then, you know, like you said. Are we good? I would like to meet everybody before they run off. But thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. It was a pleasure to be here. <laughs>